So hair is important. Like I never, to be honest, I never thought that hair is that important because that wasn't my main, I didn't start as a hairdresser. What did you start doing? I worked for Chanel and Estee Lauder many years in Israel. I started as a beauty advisor in the bottom. And then I climbed, that was as a first, not as a bottom, but like, you know, as the first position. Right. This is the first thing that you start um, in the cosmetic world. And then I moved to be a manager of the promotion team. And then I left as still older. I went to Chanel. Uh, in Chanel, I was five years makeup director in Israel. I was deciding um, what kind of makeup, what kind of look, how people will look in Israel um, according to Chanel guideline. And then I moved back to Estee Lauder and I was a um, sales manager. Did my, how do you call it? My print, I left my print in the cosmetic world in Israel and I left. So for those of you, we didn't do a formal intro. Um, with me is Israel Edry, the world famous, Boca renowned Israel Edry, yes. uh, who is an incredibly prominent, very talented, is it a hairdresser or is it a stylist or is it, I know you're the business owner, right? And, but how, what is the title for what you do? Well, <laughs> depends who you ask. If you ask my client, they'll tell you that I'm the hair doctor. Okay. That actually, the blonde doctor. The blonde right? doctor. Yeah. I do a lot of blondes, um, but I'm not mainly just for blonde. Doing like a good brown or doing like a good brunette is as hard as doing a good blonde. Because people think, oh, I'm just going to take color, I'm going to put it in, your, in my hair, and then it's going to be right. perfect. But it doesn't work like that. Hair doesn't work like that. Hair is a lot more complicated than what people think. <laughs> it, there is a lot of science to it. There is a lot of um, innovations. But at the end of the day, hair is hair. Got created as millions of years ago with the same hair, same structure, nothing has changed. The body anatomy doesn't change. Whatever is changing is the products and the innovations. But I always remember to go back to basics. And I think that's what makes me different than a lot of people because I always think about the health of the hair before everything and the results, of course. Um, I took hair to another, to another level. I was, I want to say forced by God to go and study hair because- I have to hear how that works. Yeah. <laughs> so when I started, I started as a makeup artist, artist like I said, and then um, state board walked into the salon that I was working. I did not know that there's such a thing when I moved here. Um, I was doing only makeup and he asked me, what are you doing here? And I said, makeup. And he said, where's your license? So I showed him my international work, my international certificate from Israel, which I worked all over the world with. Um, and he said, no, nope, you have to go back to school. That doesn't work over here. In the United States, we have- um, Right in Florida? In all the United States, we have a state board of right. cosmetology. And that will give you the umbrella of like doing makeup and hair and anything that you want to do related to nail skin and hair. And I went and I did the school. Um, I was thinking about doing just aesthetics, just so I can continue my work as a makeup artist. But then I told myself, why not doing everything? And I fell in love with hair, something that I never thought. My mom always wanted me to do hair and I said, no, I hate it. I don't like touching people's hair. And I never thought that hair is that important till I really walked into hair school and it changed my perspective. And then I realized, wow, hair is important to people. Um, I'm personally bold. Like I'm trying something new right now for my clients and it's the non-surgical hair. So for me, 20 years, I was bald. You know, I was always the bald hairdresser and I loved it. I never thought that it was a big deal till the last year I started exploring more about like the men aspect of hair and men are a lot more difficult than women. <laughs> I have wow, to admit. Yes, yes. Men are a lot more picky. They are very meticulous as much as it doesn't look like that. But like, I'll tell one, you, I, I'm, you know, I, 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 I'm very much into, into male grooming. Mm -hmm. This is my place of it's Zen important. actually that I go to. It's, it's a, on a clock. And when I moved down here and I'm sorry to cut you off, but no, 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 it's okay. Um, uh, when I moved down here, I've been going to the same guy who's like, you know, you tell the haired guy become friends. Yes. 
you know, and 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 then really hard. I went to like twenty different places until I landed on one that that, that I like. And hair plays a big role in my history because I wouldn't have met my wife if it wasn't for my sister-in-law and the hairdresser that she went to. And alternatively, my wife went to as well. That's who made the shit up. That's who made the match. Oh, amazing. I had a couple of clients that got married after they got their hair done with me. Really? They met their husband. One in the supermarket, believe it or not. <laughs> and one in a date. And the first thing that he told her was like, oh my God, your hair is amazing. And she's like, she texted me after that. She's like, I think I found my husband <laughs> and they're married. So for people that don't follow Israel Edry on online on Instagram, like I've seen it because of, of my wife. I mean, I, I wasn't looking for hair products, but I follow you. And the transformations that you have, that you can see of somebody coming in to the how they come out, it's like, it's like a completely different product. Like everything looks cleaner and bouncier and fluffier. But what it does to a woman specifically is... It's like having a really nice outfit and it, it adds to her confidence and it makes exactly. her feel beautiful. And it's, and I, I recognize how important that is. It's, and my wife, and I told you this on the phone, you know, you steal my wife for what's supposed to be a three hour appointment, sometimes for seven and I hate you for it. Hey, but, but she works over there. Yeah. But you know <laughs> she what? She does a lot. She told she, me I do a lot more here than I do at home. Yeah. The, so. <laughs> but she comes home, she's got a little more bounce in her step. Yes. You know what I mean? So it's important. And you spend so much time with these people that you get to know them on an interpersonal level. Mm -hmm. I tell you what, hair, I think it's like, so I do my salon. My salon is a different place. I call it my little greenhouse because it's like my little family. Uh, my clients are local clients. They are, um, they live in Boca or they live all over the world. I have clients from all over the world that comes to see me today whether if it's for like a big transformation or just to come and say hi. Um, those are people that I met throughout the years. I can tell you that hair touch, I think like it takes you out of reality a little bit. It puts you like in the perspective that you're going into the salon, you leave everything outside, you're just going in, you enjoy, you have your glass of wine or your glass of coffee or anything, um, or you're sitting down on your computer, you're enjoying the Wi-Fi, or you're watching TV, or you're just enjoying your time. So you said like seven hours, but nobody believed that they've been there for seven hours. I know after you look at the clock, you're like, oh shit, I have to pick up well, my kids. Is, well, that's what yeah. happens. Like, uh, I need to go sorry, and pick up my kids. <laughs> I love being here. I can't believe I've been here for six, five, four, three hours. Um, Cause we make it fun, you know, it's not just, Hey, come, I put the foils and you go in. It's becoming more personal. It's becoming more of a scape of reality and having more of a calm mind because regardless, whatever is happening in the world right now, the world is a tough place to live. Yeah. You know, um, it's a tough place to live. Depends like if you want to be somebody in this world or you want to be just another person. If you want to put your foot, your footprint in the sand, or you just like just want to walk by. Um, I'm a person. I'm here to influence the world for the good, and by talking to people and a lot of key note people over here in Boca, people that are like today. I hold. I want to say the elite of Boca Raton. And they're my uh, clientele and I'm very close to them. And to listen to people in that level and what they think about the world or what they think about life is first enriching my mind. And second, it's another perspective to look at things in the world. Um, I do love my clients. I'm very, very close to them. I will often give them a lot of advices that come from talking to other people and then understanding that basically a lot of humans being are actually the same and they don't know that. So it's very interesting to talk to people and hear what they think about the world and what they think about life in general. And then seeing those things or those words repeating, repeating themselves one way or another. Um, and I love giving the advice and I also love to hear the advice that I get because in Hebrew you say, Mikol melamdai eskalti. From all the people that wants to teach me, I will learn, you know? And I like that. When did you move from Israel to the United States? I actually just celebrated 10 years um, in the United States. 
Did Since you I move right to Florida? Yes. Yes. I used to come and visit here a lot. My brother lives here for, I want to say 40 years. Wow. Um, he built a life over here since he was very young. And I used to come visit here when I wanted to escape like reality. And when I wanted to just like be out of town, I would like book a flight in 24. Is he still here? Yeah. That's good. So you have family here. That's kind of nice. Yes. Yes. I have my brother, my nephews, my nieces, and my grand nieces and nephew. So, <laughs> and you're close with them? Very. Yes. We're a very close family. Um, I'm very close to all my brothers and sisters. I love them. They still in Israel, all of them. Um, I do have a little family over here, but my majority is still in Israel. I have to go back to something just because it cannot be understated. The, the podcast is a resource and we're very technical, at least when it started from logistics and how to get here from building credit to immigration lawyer, accountants, <coughs> lawyers, all, everything in between schooling, you know, all that sort of stuff. But I can tell you that one of the points that was most stressful to my wife is finding the right hairdresser, someone that she can talk to, somebody that can get the work done, somebody somewhere she can feel comfortable. And for a lot of women, I, I, don't, I didn't have enough focus on it, which is why I was so eager to have you on, because mm -hmm. they don't know where to go when they're coming down here, because it's one of those things that they have to you know, think about. You know, yes. it's, it's, it's really, really important. So um, amongst other things that we're definitely going to chat about, I, I want people to know that um, there are places to go. And if you're thinking about hair, you know, if you want to just test it out, Israel is a, is, is a great guy to go to. And, I, and I'm not trying to plug you from any other perspective, but I can see what you've done for, for Francis. Like she really looks forward to going to you, um, right? It's, it's in the calendar. We know that that time booked off. That's her time. She goes there and she always comes back with a renewed set of self-confidence, but also she feels better about herself. So, you know, it's important that it's not just the, all the logistic things that are important. Oh, absolutely. It's also like, like these things, they seem small, but they're not insignificant to, to somebody like getting your nails done or, you know, stuff like that. So I, I can't understate it, but um, you touched on something that about moving down here. So mm -hmm. you originally are from Israel. Yes. Were you born there? Yes. How about your parents? Was, were they born there? No, my parents made Aliyah when they were five and my dad was five. My mom was three. Uh, my mom moved from Tunisia and my dad moved from Morocco. Interesting. Huh? Yes. How it plays out because yes. how many Jews are left? <laughs> Not. Um, I don't want to say anything that I'm, I don't know completely. Critly, but there is a lot of Jewish and not, not as a, a percentage lot, of like, when your parents left, it might oh, be like, you know, 5%. 5%. Yeah. It's something. <laughs> yes, yes. And this is what people don't understand. Right. And there's a lot of confusion and stuff like yes, that. Yes. Yes. They, well, I want to say that the Jewish people was scattered like all over the world. Like the biggest community of the Jewish people was in Iran, believe it or not. And then all the changes that happen over there politically. At the time of the Shah. Yeah, yes, of course. They had to fled um, like many other Jews in the world. Besides that, when you talk to when you talk to people that God for them is everything and you know Elohim Hashem. And when Israel was created as a country, that was their goal. Is to move there, is to make the Aliyah home. Same with my family. Exactly. Like their first home was Israel. That's it. Like we have a Jewish country. We're the Jewish people. This is the promised land. This is where we want to go. And this is where we want to die. So this is one thing about the Israelis and the Jewish people. I have to say they, they are strong people. They've been through it's a tough neighborhood. They've been through, they've been through a lot. You know, people always tell me, you know, poor Israel, like everything that they've been going through in the past 75 years. And I'm like, maybe try 7,000. Right. Cause throughout history, you can read the Bible. And it was always the massacre of the Hebrew people, Jewish people. It was always like them getting pursued. And we're living into it today as a modern days. We are still, no matter what's happening in the world, we are still hunted. very hunted. Yes, people don't like us. Did you serve in the army? I did. You did? Yes. It was wonderful because I did, um, I was in the military police. I was a detective. Uh, it was nice. It was not too much information, nothing that can risk my personal life. And, but I felt like I can serve my country in the way that I can. I could not do combat and things like that because it was never my strength. <laughs> yeah. Know? I think to people that don't understand. I'm good. You you enter, 
So like everybody has a talent, right? Mm -hmm. There's, there's an entire unit in the military mm -hmm. dedicated to purely intelligence. There's yes. like, you know, the unit 8200 or, you know, yes. these are for like super bright. Some are on the spectrum, uh, you yes. know, like they have a, a, a different skill base that is, that they can use in the military. And then before you enter service, they look at men and women based on their physical and mental attributes and see where they could be best suited. And they don't just throw everybody into infantry or whatever. It's of a, course. You know, it's very, very calculated and very technical. And most people don't, don't understand what Israel is like. Were most you, people, I'm sorry to cut you off. No, no. Most people don't really understand that the Israeli army is not really an army is a defense force. There is a difference. You know, when you go to the army in Israel, first you go as a child, you're going like 18 years old and it's mandatory for everyone. To three go. years for men, two years for women? Correct. Um, and three, ways, three years for women that are doing combat. My niece is actually doing combat and she's signed for three years. She's actually in Totchanim, which is like the first lines. And, um, you know, unlike other armies, defense force in the world, the Israeli army never teach you how to kill people, but how to defend yourself and how to defend your country. And I think there is a huge difference between the two. Um, I was never taught how to kill. I was never taught how to massacre or like to go full force on anything. If you press, if you shot your gun, it must be like the best reason. And sometimes even the best reason is not enough. Um, as Jewish people, we're not allowed to take life. Only God can do that. So, and I'm very much of a God person. I grew up um, in a house that were very Masolti, very um, religion, uh, but you know, modern Orthodox. And I want to say <laughs> that this like escorted me my entire life to understand that there is a higher power first, and then that we always have to defend ourselves. And that's why joining into the army changed my life because, um, sorry, joining to the Israeli Defense Force changed my life because I was looking at life in a, dis in a different perspective. I learned how to appreciate time. I learned how to appreciate home. And I learned how to appreciate good food. <laughs> and I look, from what I see right now, listen, the Israelis are getting pe fed pretty good, probably maybe a little too well, good. Well, yeah, you know, because at the beginning they say we have no food, we have no this. So obviously all the people, you know, you're coming incredible. into my salon and the first thing is like, what do you want to eat? What do you want to drink? You know, it's it's the culture thing. Um, we still have the Moroccan culture in us that like you have to eat, you have to drink, you sure. have to be like first feelful and then we can continue the work um and i think like this is this is another thing that the army teaches you and it teaches you the values of life the values of that every life is important you know we never want to get into a war we never want to go and kill like we will always be the first you know when i'm telling it to my clients when we're talking about like all the the peace agreements that we have in the world. And you know what? I always said that Israel is the first country to sit in that table, to come and sit at the table. When it comes to peace, we will always going to be the first. And that's what people don't see. And that's what people tend to forget really quickly because we were willing to give land to have peace. We were willing to be closer, having two countries in one, having two states in like one place, like one country, but divided to two. I don't see anywhere in the world that can happen. I mean, I don't need the, the reality of all of what you're saying is it's incredibly accurate, but the narrative has been hijacked mm -hmm. throughout many years of propaganda. And now you've got things like social media and everybody on their oh, yeah. phones. Everybody's become a mini journalist and spins their own way and it's become a numbers game. Mm -hmm. So, um, you've always had biased, um, mainstream media, and it really depended on which side of the political spectrum you were on. And now you have, it, what I mean by numbers game, if you have people that are pro-Palestinian, pro-terrorism, um, there's a lot more of those people that believe that than, than Jews mm -hmm. um, in general. So on a social media, it's easy to indoctrinate the people that are quote unquote on the neutral middle ground because you see so many more likes, shares, posts, comments, all that sort of stuff. And there seems to be a bit of a, a, of a pushback finally from everybody else. 
but from a purely numbers game, we don't we don't stand a chance. We never have. We of never course, will. you can't compare one point nine million to two billion, right? You know. And so the argument I've had people say is, well, not everybody's into terrorism, and not everybody's into murder, and I have to agree wholeheartedly. But their silence versus what they claim to be against is deafening. Exactly. It's non-existent. Um, the one thing that I'm, I, I'm hesitant to post a lot of my own personal stuff, I share a comment, um, is what really gets to me right now is um, people think that what happened in Dagestan and Russia or what is happening with these rallies and protests throughout the world is an anti-Jewish um, rallies. What I'm explaining to them and they're not sure because the people a lot of people are asking me you know what are your thoughts about that what do you think i'm mm -hmm. saying this is a warning to everybody else if they stand with israel this is what will happen the only leg that the hamas has to stand on today is a ceasefire so what they're going to do is create ruckus throughout the civilized world where people will say whoa, whoa, whoa we didn't ask for this we don't have a dog in this fight why are people fighting in our streets why are stores getting vandalized why are rallies happening so it has nothing to do with Jews, it has to do specifically with the warning to anybody that will stand with Israel. And or, with anybody, or with anybody that doesn't believe in their own Right, agenda. so, th there's, so there, there's a whole process. So it doesn't matter what religious you are, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, it's, the danger is for, it's for everybody. Everybody, and there are communities that I will not in my mind ever understand why they have sided on the side of terrorism. You see it in schools, You'll see it in universities, you see it down the streets from, from the Black Lives Matter movements, from the LGBT community, from, you know, I've, I've seen so many preposterous things that if you actually put them in a room and you told them your values, your core values, they would not stand with you. In fact, they would harm you, but yet you chose a side. Yes. Where anti-Semitism seems to <clears throat> trump people's belief. And that to me is something i will never understand because we will never understand why they hate us so much exactly that doesn't make any sense so yeah it does not make any sense because you know growing up jewish my mom always told me hide your star of david when you travel don't tell people that you're jewish don't wear your star of david when you're traveling the world because my mom was scared and to be honest like living like that sucks <laughs> You know, um, I never want to be, I never want to be ashamed. That's why I have this tattoo. So I cannot take it off ever. Um, so I'm very proud to be Jewish and I'm very proud of my religion. I'm very proud in the world. Like I love people. I don't care what you believe. As long as you're a good person, as long as you're doing good to the world, you know, like I tell everybody at the end of the day, you can be billionaire, millionaire. You can have mentions, you can have anything that you want. We're going naked up there. And we the only came, thing that you take, in, we came out the same way. Exactly, and the only thing that you take with you, it's what you did in this life. And I want to go up there knowing that I did the best that I can to make people happy, to create as much as peace as I can between any person that I can see. Um, I actually like my clientele contain so many people: Muslims, Jewish. Um, I have Buddhists. I have so many religions that are coming into my salon and gathering together and they're all amazing people. Like I never had any type of antagonism against. That would have been my question if you've seen, but have you seen business drop off from other non-Jewish clients? No, not really. I'm busy as ever. Thank God. Like people love me for what I do and for my ideologies and for my beliefs also and um, I'm very close to my people I'm very close to my clients I don't go very deep into religion and politics and work because it's always creating some kind of like tense uh, between people because some people believe in that way and some people believe in that way um, and you know one thing that we learn in the Torah is that ish ish every person in his own belief will live. And I like that. I like that. If you're a good person and you're serving your cause in life, like your goal in life to create happiness and to be good, to do good deeds, you will succeed. And sometimes 
it can be interacted. I'm not saying I'm not I'm not oblivious and I'm not living in a bubble that you can only I don't think you like. Are. Uh, but I I want to believe that the world can be good and can be changed. I do believe that there is more good than bad in the world. I do believe there is a bad war right now. If you ask me what's the biggest war right now, it's between good and evil. Um, and I do believe that there is more good than evil in this world. And I think God is so strong that we will win. The good people will win. Your, your perspective is refreshing. Um, you have a really good energy about you. Um, I know what you're trying to do. Um, I'll say that there is a time to be good and there's a time to be bad. And when evil tries to creep into to the light, mm -hmm. the only way evil understands is when you speak its own language. I know. And um, it's come down to the point where we've gone in two separate worlds. And when I say the Western world has spent their last 40, 50 years, um, you know, really since since probably the Holocaust, and there's a lot of atrocities that have happened in between that, but building better families, assimilating into communities, having a better life, a more comfortable life, uh, earning mental health, body health, all these sorts of things. And then you have another segment of the world that has hardened and emboldened and lived under squalor and poverty and, and evil and hate, which you're going to harden these people. And that's what's coming back right now because Israel was about to sign a peace treaty or normalized relations with, with, with Saudi Arabia. And I've mentioned this in the show several times which is huge, the light. That is what everybody aspires to. And, and yet that was exactly what they wanted to kibosh mm -hmm. and, and, and keep the world fighting and, 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 and looking at the Palestinian people, which as a whole are a bunch of horribly treated human beings that have been um, put under dictatorship, under military rule, and um, have been really uh, imprisoned by Hamas. And I want to believe in my heart that in amongst those people, if they're free to speak openly, they will choose to live like the Arab Muslims living in Israel. They will choose to live- They did it. Yeah, within. The people, the people within Gaza that didn't believe in this dictatorship and they didn't want this life, they left. They left the first 24 hours. But the ones that are still there, they can't. you can't possibly tell me that they really believe in all of Hamas's rhetoric and they actually want to live that way. I think that Israel is going Nobody in there to, to live that way. I, I agree. No Nobody wants to live to that way because think about it. Okay, so I have to say something about that. Please. Because at 2005, when we gave the land, the land of, yeah, we walked of, out Gaza, of Gaza, and we walked Bank. out and we gave them this whole strip, which is ginormous. Um, I want to say there were 335,000 people today. There are 2.1 million. So if we're so bad and we're so evil people and kill people, I don't know how they can grow to that big of population. Now, I think they just got used to with the years of yeah, being under indoctrination. Of and course. And then don't forget that if you say something, you're going to get killed. So you better shut up. So this is, I mean, this is I, happening. We, so we know many, the obvious, but yes. we've lost the narrative. Mm -hmm. Right? Words like apartheid, genocide, ethnic cleansing, all this open air prison. It's all a crock of shit. It, it doesn't exist. But people that hate Jews found that to hang their hat on. And now we're murdering babies and doing all these things in the form of war. Well, it was like, like Black Lives Matter when everything started because of one George Floyd that what happened, that everything got exploded and got to like major, um, I want to say almost civil war over here. Was it that Again. bad? I, I wasn't in the state. Yes, it was very bad. It was very bad. Um, you heard that over the news about everything because somebody wanted to make a point. Um, and I want to say like eventually people realized that this thing was more political agenda and money agenda. And people understood that those specific people weren't there for their benefits. Right, they were in there for the greater good. To exactly to, to exploit. But when you stand up, I mean, there are so many people that I follow and I and I appreciate dearly for everything that they say because they come in with facts and they talk numbers. Um, I personally follow this majestic woman called Brigitte Gabriel. I don't know if you heard about her. her. 
I yeah. follow her. I've been following her for I've been following her for years. I'll be honest with you, I even messaged her to I, see me if too. I can have her on the podcast. Me too. Yeah. Well, not about the podcast. I messaged her to just say, you know what? I just want to say thank you. Yeah. I want to say thank you for all these years coming out with those numbers, with those facts that nobody you don't hear that. You don't hear that enough. I think like and you you were mentioning like how they get like so much so many people to support them and we're not i think like one of the biggest thing is that we don't have enough of brigitte gabriel in the world we don't have enough of those people to talk those facts to actually talk in the favor and not just the jewish people but against terrorism and i think like this is the major thing if people will more concentrate about terrorism and about what's happening in the world because it doesn't have to be just a war between Israel and Palestine. It can be also the war that's happening in third world countries. Like people get killed because there is not enough supply or they live under a dictatorship that the country has the money, but the money doesn't go to the people. And that's exactly what happened with Gaza also. You know, if we left Gaza in 2005 and we left it like paradise, okay? I I personally, um, as a kid, we used to travel to Gaza. I used to go to Rafiach. I used to go to all these places. It was good, and then you go to Gush Katif, where it's the the people that colonized around Gaza and it was still Israel territory. That place was heaven on earth, like the best shores, um, beautiful. the 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 produce was so delicious and so good and so fresh. And you think to yourself, okay, we left it like that in two thousand and five. You had almost twenty years to be the next Dubai, basically. Like, those people got so much money right. from Israel, from the world. They didn't use it for the right thing. The, How is Gaza still looking the way that it's looking after all these hundreds of billions of dollars that was donated to promote them and to give them a country, you know? We all state the same facts because we know them. And this is, this is where, where the crux of the problem lies. People that don't want to hear facts, people that don't want to hear reality. That's people, a big problem. They're just too busy and you can't hide it anymore. Are hating Jews and hating democracy and hating the free speech of the world. They have found a way to um, monetize, capitalize and oppress an entire generation of, of, of people to... You, you can't unlearn hate that quickly, right? And no, you're not going to do it via social media. Zero right. from and, the moment. And this, and this is a problem. And then you have you have even Jews and that speak, you know, against their own cause. That and the other side would murder them without even a batting an eyelash. Oh, Neto Carta, the the people that that storm everything. Congress, women, know. Western women, LGBTQ, um, so many people that they they're not into their believes even women in general if you're not covered if you're just gonna speak you're gonna die yeah like for them women was born to clean bring children and be a good wife that's it like there is no western night so all those people that go and march they don't even know the fact before they're like i know the only country in the Middle East today that women can be women and they can work and they can have a job and they can walk with like shorts and tank tops is Israel. Like it's the only democracy in the Middle East that actually gives you the freedom of speech and leave the way that you want. Right. And they don't, you know, it's very much like the United States. You can practice your religion. We don't, there is no, you have to be Jewish or you die. You know, we're welcoming and we're loving. There is a lot of churches, mosques, synagogues right. um, and temples in Israel that you don't see all over the world, you know, and we're actually Israel preserving all those places because they know how important it is to other religious. So it's very welcoming. And then you have the LGBTQ, which are very close to me because I have a lot of family, friends, and people that belongs uh, to the LGBTQ. And I What's their to stance on it? What did they tell you? Uh, what did they tell me? 
the people that live in Israel are like, oh, they're stupid, they're motherfuckers, they don't understand what's going to happen. If they're going to walk in Palestine, they will die. Can you imagine the having a gay parade down the, or organizing a gay parade down the Gaza Strip? Do you realize <laughs> how quickly they'd be running to Tel Aviv? A day, well, no. In Tel Aviv, you can do it freely and loving and from all over the no, world. No, no, I but mean, if you go, from, from Gaza to, if they try to organize a gay parade in Gaza, you oh, know that quickly would they would have to run to Tel Aviv for shelter? Because uh, they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't be able even to go in, right? Like, and or actually, they will let them go in to just kill them over there and tell them. And you know, there is countries in the world that take the gay people and they hang them on the tree so people will see. I think in their eyes, that. yes, it's happening. It's happening. And yet that community supports them. Yeah, yeah. It, it, is it, it a minority of the com the community that's just being the most boisterous and loud, or is it? Do you think? the the overwhelming sentiment within the I community. think the overwhelming sentiment because I do believe that even in the gay community there is like um there is people that believe that what's happening in Israel and what's happening in Israel is devastation um I don't know to tell you to be honest it's I a I complicated see thing. I, it's a complicated it's a very complicated thing because the LGBTQ grew so strong in the past decade you know, they became very strong in every government that is a democracy, okay? You will never see the LGBTQ in Iran, Saudi Arabia, um, all the religious Muslim country you would not see, but yet Israel is a religious country and they have a room in the government, in the cities. They have, they, as, an, as a religious country, they do get all the benefits of being married. So they should, because they're humans. Of course, right? And love is love. Yeah, you know? I, and and I, and I said that if to you, you spread your love, I don't care what you are. I mean, if you love lizards, okay. <laughs> this, this is not some. I I have, um, I have my own points of view mm -hmm. on these things, and um, I personally uh, am uncomfortable by especially what's happening with um, the the medical castrations and, and and those sorts of things, like treating kids that are not of age to make decisions. Uh, I'm extremely uncomfortable with that. I don't believe that um, that should be um, taught in schools because the argument I hear all the time is it's something that you're born with mm -hmm. uh, and it's a choice that you have and love is love and I'm and I can respect that. I think that you can um, really influence a child's decision and they shouldn't from the very little I understand about it, they shouldn't have be making medical decisions if they can't drive a car. I agree. I, or if they can't own a firearm. I agree. Right. It's such a I'm very uncomfortable with that and somehow having an opinion like that makes me a bigot or some sort of sexist or pig or I don't even know what the term is for somebody like me and so be it because I'm trying to keep my kids away from it until they can rationally make their own decisions on major life matters, you know, medical which is an irreversible thing. Exactly. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly uncomfortable with it. Um, but if one of my kids, I would be extremely um, uncomfortable with this, told me that they were gay or something like that. I would be devastated inside and, and I would be the first one to support them throughout their entire life because they are my kid just because of the choice that they made. Um, I can't stop loving my child. Of course. And, and, and it's something that I've, I've hear parents saying and, and I become very divisive and depends on how religious you are and stuff like that. But you know, I, how do I stop loving somebody because of some of the, the choice that they made of who to love. And, and, and I know I have, People, people listening and, and friends that will be like, I can't believe you're saying that. And I'm like, I'm openly saying that because do I agree with it? No. Do I agree with any of the transgender stuff that's going on? No, I don't understand it at all. I don't agree with it. I don't think kids should be making, making that decisions. But if indeed, you know, being uh, in love with a man or woman is something that you're born with, I can't, and this is something that my kid ever chooses, I would be very disappointed, but I can't stop loving my my kid. Of course, I know. I know from personal uh, perspective because I dated women, I dated men. When I told my parents that I'm going to date the men for the first time, they, my mom never 
said anything bad. My dad was like a little bit weird about it. And I can tell you that they never stopped loving me. I'm the youngest out of eight. So I'm the prince of family. Eight? Yes. Oh. <laughs> My mom is a hero. I, uh, I bless her for everything that she did in, in life. And she's, she's my biggest hero in my life because she's been through so many things. And, you know, her goal was to raise kids and to raise good kids. Um, the values that they put in us is that be good, you'll find good. That's a sentence that takes me my entire life. My mom always tell me, you do good, you will find good, no matter how tough the situation is. And, you know, we're very, we're human beings. So when something bad happened, we're looking to, to blame it on. And I learned in my life that, like, there is only one person to blame it on, and it's yourself for everything that you do. Yeah, nobody wants to take responsibility of anymore, course. right? But the more, but the I want to say when you take responsibility, it makes life a lot easier. It's liberating. Of course. I because can make my then, own decisions. Exactly. And then like you can also fix it. Like you can fix it for the next time. That it's not going to be like that. You're going to make yourself better. That's what learning so, is. So exactly. Um, I don't believe in mistakes. I believe in lessons. I really choose carefully the words that comes out of my mouth. I try to use not negative words, but only like good words, like very positive. Um, and I think that's, what do we think that leading me in life? And you know, you will always find me positive no matter what. Because even when you're bad, nobody fucking wanna know. Nobody cares. <laughs> you can yeah. go and tell stories to as people. As long as you're not committing a crime, you're hurting somebody. Exactly. You know, whatever, bad oh, is absolutely. relative. Mm -hmm. I've been asking the same question from a lot of people uh, lately, and I really wanna get yours because you have a unique situation. Do you still have a mezuzah on, do you have a mezuzah on your, on your business? On every door. Do you, are you gonna take it down? Never good for I, 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 I'm like, Never. I, I had a guest. Like on a I told of you, days. I'm a person of God. And like, when I'm saying I'm a person of God, I'm not like all day long praying and everything. I, I, I wake up in the morning. I say, thank you for God for bringing back my soul back to my life. Um, I put my fill in, I keep kosher. I don't work on Shabbat. Those are the things that I feel a hundred percent that I can do with all of my heart without being like, Oh, because somebody say that I have to do it. I will do it. No, I love it. I feel it. I feel the change in me since I was because You're spiritual. Yes, very much so. Very much so. And the reason that I tell you about that is because our praying books, our old scripts, our, those are our protection. Those are the protection of the people. So, you know, people say, um, back in the days, Golda Meir said, like, you should not worry because we have a secret weapon. And we have nowhere to go. <laughs> we have nowhere to go. And she never said, what is the secret weapon? To me, my secret weapon was always going to be God because you can look through history and we were like 10 soldiers compared to 10,000 and we won. I believe in a higher power. I believe in God escorting us. So the reason that I will never take my mezuzahs off is because this is my protection. And if I have to die because of my beliefs and because I'm Jewish, then this is what life gave me. This is what God wants. And I'm, I will die for the cause. You understand? For the cause of being Jewish, I will always say that will, I am will Jewish. Will you fight back? Yes. Good. Absolutely. I think that's the main difference of today. And because of Israel's existence, we can say that because um, we have generations that, that didn't and we know the outcome of that. Um, but when I asked you about your mezuzah, for you, you your name is on the door. Your name is Israel. Mm -hmm. Israel Edry. And it, your, your, your name is on the on, you know, on, on the top, buildings, on right? everything. So do you ever feel unsafe now? Do you ever worry about I do. security? I do. Okay. Um, do you protect yourself? I want to tell you, yes, I am. I am I'm very uh, much connected to a lot of uh, big security companies. And so this is the thing, by being a hairdresser, I'm going back to hair and how hair got me to where I am in my life. Um, I got to meet pretty interesting people in life and I got to make very good connection in life. Um, so, you know, like Francis loved me and because I love her too. And it's a, it's a genuine love yeah. between me and my clientele, I don't like to call them clients, you know? So like, they're like my family because sure. I see them so much and I see them pretty often, you know, it's very different. Like the hair structure here in the United States, very different from the world. Over here, people are like super every four weeks, every five weeks, every six weeks. So it's becoming 
a long-term relationship and people don't leave their hairdressers, you know, their hairdressers. Yeah, well, like, I, know I can this. tell you one of oh my, my clients told her boyfriend, like, I will break up with you before I break <laughs> up with him. Like, it's true. I can put her on the line right now and she will tell you, like, she's like, you are my God. I'm like, no, don't call me that. Like, I, I, I don't want to be, you're saying. I don't want to be anybody's God. I want to be an inspiration. Sure. Um, you know, my dream I work very, like I told you, I work very hard in this world, like to put my footprint and my dream, my dream in the future is to have a nonprofit organization that will gather all the people that want to spread love and that you can say and talk and do everything that you want freely without thinking, oh, I'm Jewish, oh, I'm Muslim, oh, I'm this and this, you know, like be a part of this big community that is all about peace and love and spreading it to the world. Uh, and that would be my footprint because I can talk to people and I can pursue people to understand that there is a different perspective of everything, good and bad. You know, your intentions are pure. And if there's anything that I've learned and it's become, you know, it's in, in the back of my head since I was a kid and I've learned very recently is that anybody with good intentions that organizes a bunch of other people will almost always have to cater to the minority that doesn't believe and infiltrates these groups. Mm -hmm. And it's very, it's, although it's a noble cause, um, it's, I'm going to say it's impossible because you're never going to get enough people that are like-minded that are going to say the same thing um, without having a difference of opinion. But that's the beautiful part about living in a democratic society. That's a beautiful part about mm -hmm. living in, in a melting pot of, of human beings, right? Um, we are unfortunately on the cusp of what is the scariest time in our humanity. Exactly. I and, think so also. And uh, I, I've said this to many people, and I hate to say it because I don't want to see, sound like a fear monger, but um, it hasn't really started yet. And yes. the more successful Israel will become in trying to rid the world of the cancer that is Hamas and Islamic Jihad and, and everything in between. It's going to get harder. It's going to take to the streets everywhere around the world because those are not an organized um, defense force. And the quote unquote moderates, people that don't have a, uh, a dog in the fight are going to say, well, whoa, whoa, we didn't sign up for this. Why is this happening in our streets? And that's why I go back to my original point of like, what's happening that you see around the world is not um, to threaten Jews. It's a warning to everybody else mm -hmm. what's coming. A hundred percent. If you allow Israel to defend itself. And what I keep saying over and over, and I'm going to make a post about this because I try not to, is nobody is asking for your fucking permission anymore. Exactly. And I love that. I love that because Israel has the right to defend itself. As do we everywhere. We Absol are Israel yes, everywhere. Absolutely. And we and we love our country. We love the United States. We love the people, the, the opportunities that we have. And we say that with open heart and open minds. A hundred percent. I agree. I, um, I agree with you a hundred percent on that because every person has the right to defend himself uh, from terror because... And this is terror. This is... This is terror. Like, you know, I never thought, and I tell that to everybody, I said, I never thought in my entire life that I will get to see the Holocaust happening all over again. And, you know, some people would say, you cannot compare, you cannot compare. I'm like, yes, I can compare. I can compare very big time. We're not talking about the numbers of the Holocaust because that's happened for four years and the whole world knew and shut up. This time we have social media and people see everything, for the good and the bad, people will see everything and people will see a genocide of babies and women and elderly. And all that stuff's being denied, right? Because oh, yeah. you don't- you Because it's the easiest thing to do. Of course. And because it's Jewish people, so right. they will prevail. They've been through so much, so. Israel, you are a neshama, you are Thank a soul, you. you're a good human. I'm grateful for you taking the time from Thank your very you. busy schedule to be down here. Thank you, uh, I appreciate We've talked it. about all sorts of things, but one thing I'd like for you to leave out there is how can people that are, you know, the season starting mm -hmm. and people are gonna be coming here for vacation and getting their hair wet in the salt water and doing all that stuff. Yes. How can they get a hold of you? Um, you can get a hold of me uh, throughout, like if you just put my name on online, you will find me in a second. Instagram, it's my first name, last name, super easy. Uh, Spell you will it. see Israel, I-S-R-A-E-L, like the country, Edri, E-D-R-I. Um, and 
you can find me throughout all social medias uh, and websites and internet. Like it's easy. It's easy. And, uh, and if you ever need a review, just, just contact my wife. Yes. <laughs> I'm not putting her <laughs> contact out there, but uh, uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank I you. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye.